there. Good morning. Good morning. How's everyone today? And highly favored. Amen. We're glad to be here today. We were kind of in the area. I was over in uh, Knoxville Friday night for a Friday night fire service for a church over there. And the uh, pastor opened an opportunity for us to be here and minister to you today. And so we're really happy to be here. Uh, it was looking at uh, GPS and MapQuest and figuring things out. I was three and a half hours away, so I thought that was going to be okay until the rock slide over on 40 and uh, heavy rains yesterday I ended up having to go up through Johnson City y'all probably know all about that and and uh, it took me about two hours and a little extra to get here but it was a great trip and enjoyed the Smokies and I'm, I'm blessed I, I always get the cheapest automobile that I can rent uh, or try to and this time it was a uh, we pick the car kind of thing, you know, that it could be anything from a compact on up. And so when I got there, I said, well, all we've got is pickup trucks. And so they put me in a brand new Dodge Ram truck. It is so nice. I'm just, uh, I've never driven such style. I've never, I've never driven a car that didn't have a gear shift. <laughs> but this one has a knob for the gears on the dash. Kind of, kind of interesting. But uh, what time are we supposed to be through? No one told me. 10.45, so we got 40 minutes. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to be here in Statesville. We thank you, Lord, for this church and this school and the ministries here and all that they're doing for you, Lord. Lord, we'd ask you this morning that you would anoint us with power from on high. You'd help us, oh God, that we might communicate Christian truths today, Lord, that would change people's lives. I ask you to bless this Sunday school class and bless our service that follows in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's kind of, uh, we're kind of doing things backwards today because I'm going to give you a, a in-depth history on the origins of the Pentecostal movement here in Sunday school, and then I'm going to do just an overview uh, in the morning service. It would be probably uh, better to do the overview first and then go into the detail, but uh, because of the nature of the services, I'm going to give you more detail this morning. Probably will tell you more than you ever wanted to know. But uh, we're going to introduce you to how the Pentecostal revival got started. It's, uh, it's an amazing thing. 115 years ago or so, uh, there were no Pentecostal people on the earth. Uh, there were people that uh, used the name Pentecostal, but there were no Pentecostal people as we know them. And today there's over 650 million spirit-filled Pentecostal charismatic people. It's been the greatest revival in the history of the Christian church. And so we're going to tell you about how that got started and, and uh, uh, how God has used it, uh, Pentecostal origins. The Pentecostal revival started with this man, Charles F. Parham. He, he is, uh, by every definition, the father or founder of the Pentecostal revival. He... He developed the Pentecostal doctrine, had the first Pentecostal Bible school, had the first uh, Pentecostal book, first Pentecostal periodical. He's just a, a remarkable man and uh, is in every way the leader of the movement. He was born, uh, Parham was born out in uh, Muscatine, Iowa, and uh, his father was a house painter. His mother uh, was uh, uh, very close to him. He had had a lot of sickness when he was a boy. Uh, you can see, uh, this is Parham, Charles Parham right here. He had a lot of sickness when he was a boy, had stomach problems, and uh, he, he was, uh, had a swollen forehead. It's what some people call a waterhead baby. And, and so he was very close to his mama. He was what we, we'd define him you know, as a mama's boy. And uh, so his mother died when he was just very young. She had died about the time this picture was made. And so he grieved over the loss of his mother because they were so very close. Never quite got over that. And uh, when his mother died, he promised her that he would meet her in heaven. The, the family was not a particularly religious family. He only remembered going to church a couple times in his childhood. But he promised his mother he'd meet her in heaven, and he made preparations to do that. 
accepted the Lord as his Savior. And he also felt like he was called to preach. It's the funniest thing. He, was, he felt like he was called to preach before he ever uh, was converted, before he ever became a Christian. He thought he was going to be a preacher. So as soon as he was uh, old enough, he went off to college to study for the ministry. He went to a place called Southwestern College in Winfield, Kansas. Uh, there's a, a picture of him in the student body. And he studied to be a Methodist preacher. Now, it's interesting. I'll back up a little bit. While he was at, uh, while he was at the college, he decided he really didn't want to be a preacher. He had, uh, he had determined that he was going to be a preacher, but he saw that preachers didn't fare so well economically or financially, and he wanted to do better in life, so he decided he'd be a doctor. Well, when he made that decision, it was kind of like a Jonah moment in his life. He didn't get swallowed by a whale, but all of the sicknesses and diseases that he'd had as a child came back on him, and he found himself uh, uh, with a debilitating disease, barely struggling to walk around campus. And uh, he got under a tree one day and prayed and said, God, if you'll heal me, I'll surrender and I'll preach the gospel. And instantly he was healed of everything that was wrong with him and committed himself right then that he was going to preach. He preached the rest of his life. He started out preaching in the Methodist church. Here he is uh, in his uh, clerical robes as he pastored a couple of Methodist churches. But he didn't last long in the Methodist church because he was a very independent-minded guy. And in the Methodist church, they have an Episcopal-type government where the, the uh, bishop uh, rules things, and he didn't like that system. So he left the Methodist church and became an independent holiness preacher where he pretty well could, uh, could uh, run his own show if he wanted to. And he, he, was, uh, he was a man who had a deep hunger for God. Everybody say the word hunger. hunger. The Bible says if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you will be filled. And he was so hungry for God, he started a pilgrimage across the United States, hooking up with different people who were notable at that time for their walk with the Lord. He went to a place called Zion, Illinois. The man named John Alexander Dowie was there. Dowie, would, as a, uh, uh, Australia, came to America from Australia during the Chicago World's Fair, had a great ministry of healing, and went outside of Chicago and built a great utopian city called Zion, Illinois. You couldn't buy uh, tobacco or alcohol in this whole city. And the streets were named after the apostles. It was quite a place. And Parham wanted to learn from him, learn about divine healing. So he went to Zion and he went over to Chicago where D.L. Moody's school was and uh, learned, learned what they were doing there, trying to pick up different things. He went all the way to New York and he met A.B. Simpson, who was the founder of the Christian and Missionary Alliance, and, and uh, learned from A.B. Simpson. He went up into Maine, met a guy named Frank Sanford. Frank Sanford was teaching that there was going to be a new baptism in the Holy Spirit, that God in the latter days was going to pour out his spirit upon people. And, of course, Charles Parham learned from Frank Sanford. He went back to Topeka, Kansas, where he was living then. This is right in the very center of the United States. He had a place there called the Bethel Healing Home. Uh, it was a place where sick people would come and get prayed for. It wasn't like a hospital. They didn't have medicine. They didn't have doctors. In fact, they didn't even believe you ought to see doctors. They believed that God would heal you. And so the people would come there that were sick and convalesce, and they'd pray over them and uh, believe God for miracles. He had a number of other ministries uh, going on there. But while he was on one of his trips out, uh, uh, one of his pilgrimages, the spiritual pilgrimages, the people that were working for him at the healing home took over his ministry. They did a little coup d'etat and took over the healing home. So he was looking for another place of ministry and he rented this old building on the outskirts of Topeka. It was called, the building was called Stone's Folly. Uh, it was really Stone's Mansion, but the locals called it Stone's Folly because a guy named Erastus uh, Stone had built this house and he ran out of money while he was building it. He, he was a prominent uh, real estate uh, man, builder there in Topeka, and started the house and, and started to build and ran out of money. The Bible, you know, says that if you're going to build a house, you ought to count the cost before you build it, and Stone didn't count the cost, so the unfinished mansion was called Stone's Folly, and that's where Parham set up his ministry in Stone's Folly, and he set up in here a Bible college. Now, this was a beautiful old mansion. 
every room in it was paneled or decorated in a different kind of wood, like one room would be oak and one room would be ash and pecans. Just, just uh, literally it was a mansion. And uh, this Bible college, they called together about 40 students. They weren't typical Bible college students of today. They weren't your, your 18, 20-year-olds. They were mostly older, mature people that had come just to pray and study the Word of God. And they studied the Word of God. In fact, that's all they studied. Uh, every day, their only textbook was the Bible. They didn't study English or geography or even theology or homiletics. They only studied the Bible. 24 hours a day, they're studying the Word of God. How many know this is a sign that somebody might be hungry for God? And not only were they studying the Bible, but they were praying 24 hours a day. This, this area here, they called it their upper room. And they would go up in that upper room and pray. And they kept prayer going 24 hours at a time. And that doesn't mean that one person prayed 24 hours. They had what we used to call in our church a prayer chain. And they'd set a time and someone would pray for an hour and they'd go down and a couple more would come up. And they'd pray for an hour or two and they'd go down. Somebody else would go up. And they kept this prayer chain going 24 hours a day. It's kind of funny because there was no stairwell that went up into the upper room so they climbed the stairs and come out here and walked across the roof and climbed out a window and in a window so they could be in their prayer room it might not have been uh, too bad in the summertime but they were having their school there in the winter time so they're out on the roof in Topeka Kansas with ice and snow crossing the roof but they were deeply hungry for God praying and seeking the Lord and and uh, Charles Parham was going to go away to Kansas City to preach. And so he asked his students to, to study, especially study the book of Acts, and see if they would find in the book of Acts where there was any physical evidence that accompanied the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And all the students studied while he was gone. He came back and he called the students together in their common room, and he asked them what they had found, what was their conclusion, and having studied the book of Acts independently, all of the students come to the same conclusion. They said in the book of Acts, when people were baptized in the Holy Spirit, they spoke in tongues. They cited Acts chapter 2 and 9 and 10 and, and 19. When the people were baptized in the Holy Spirit, they spoke in tongues. And so they decided if they had a baptism of the Holy Spirit like they had in the book of Acts, they would speak in tongues too. And they began to pray that God would baptize them in the Holy Spirit and give them the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Now, this is quite important. I want you to, I want you to pay attention to this. It's quite important because they, they did not have an experience and then try to find a biblical explanation for it. That's what a lot of people do today. They, you know, they see angel feathers or gold dust or something like that, and they try to find it in the Bible after they have the experience. But these people went to the Word of God and found what the Word of God taught them and then began to seek the experience that they had found in the Bible. And they're praying that God will baptize them in the Holy Spirit. Well, on New Year's Eve, over in Kansas City, people were singing and dancing and having a party. But in Topeka, they were having a prayer meeting. They called a watch night service and they were praying all night long. They prayed past midnight. And sometime past midnight... This lady, Agnes Osmond, asked Charles Parham to pray for her that she would receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is early in the wee hours of the morning, January 1st, 1901. And Charles Parham laid his hands on Agnes Osmond's head and prayed for her, and she started speaking in tongues. She is the first person in the modern Pentecostal charismatic movement to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The first person to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit while seeking the same. She was so full of the Holy Ghost, she spoke in tongues for four days and four nights. They could not get her to speak English. All she could do was go from one language to the other speaking in tongues. In fact, when they would give her paper to write, she couldn't even write in English. She wrote in what they called other, other languages. Now, it uh, looks kind of like chicken scratch to me, but that's the way she would write. She couldn't write in English. And a great revival broke out. Uh, people were baptized in the Holy Spirit, a number of people. A lot of ministers were baptized in the Holy Spirit. It was so big that people came, newspapers came from Chicago and, and Cincinnati. People came across the country just to see what God was doing there in Topeka. 
it looked like there was going to be a great revival. It's probably going to sweep the whole world. That's what Charles Parham was expecting. He thought they would use speaking in tongues to become missionaries and go overseas. They wouldn't have to learn the languages. They'd just speak in tongues and people could understand what they were saying. But nothing turned out exactly like they thought it would. Well, let me, I was getting ahead of myself. Lillian Thistleweight was one of the people who received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And Ed Neer and Emma Stanley and Maud Neer received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And Sarah Parham and Howard Stanley and uh, Opa Stauffer and a lot of people received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Those are some that we know their name. But after this great revival had broken out, Charles Parham had a, had a, had a small child, a little baby. You can see it here in this picture. And his wife's holding his baby. And the baby got sick. Now, they didn't believe in medicine, as I already said. They didn't believe in doctors. They believed in prayer. And so they prayed for the baby, but the baby died. And it was a very difficult time for them. Uh, you can imagine anyone that loses a child, it's such a painful thing for a parent. But for you to be a faith minister, preaching divine healing, and then your child dies, it was devastating to them. And they lost the lease on the old mansion and had to move out of the mansion. By the end of that year, the, the Stones mansion had burned to the ground. And uh, Charles Parham went in a time of, of depression, uh, introspection. He, he, he did some things. He wrote a book, different things. But the revival that they thought was going to take the world, just almost, the fire almost went out. It almost died. People began to question whether it was real or not. Even Agnes Osmond, who had, who had spoken in tongues for four days, began to question whether it was really a, a real experience or not. And, and uh, well, later she, she was restored in that and became an Assemblies of God minister. But at this particular time, it was a dark time for them. He never quit preaching. He kept, he kept, on, kept on preaching the gospel, but uh, didn't see the results he wanted to see. He came to El Dorado Springs, Missouri. And uh, El Dorado Springs is one of those places in America, I don't know if you got them in North Carolina, probably do, that has a mineral spring. And uh, the water comes out of the ground rich with minerals. And, and back in the day, uh, 120 years ago, people thought that this water, this mineral water, would bring healing to them. So lots of bathhouses and healing homes would pop up around these hot springs. And, You've probably heard of Hot Springs, Arkansas. That's where the Assemblies of God was founded. Well, that was built around one of those springs. And there was one in El Dorado, Missouri. And uh, this lady, Mary Arthur, lived in Galena, Kansas. But she came over to El Dorado Springs because she was very ill. She had been there twice. She had been there two years in a row, spent the summer there. But she didn't get any better. She didn't want to go back, but her husband insisted that she go back because she was so ill she was blind in one eye and going blind in the other eye. And she had all kinds of internal problems, plumbing problems. She was really, she was really a mess, uh, probably uh, uh, near death when they brought her back there to El Dorado Springs. And, and Charles Parham had come there and he was preaching. What a great place for a faith preacher to preach. It's a place where all the sick people live. And so he's preaching there. And Mary Arthur heard him preach and went over to his house for him to pray for her. And while she was there, Charles Parham prayed for her. And we don't understand everything about the story, but he put some kind of a, a, a compact or compress on her eyes. And, and after he'd prayed for her, and he sent her down to her home. And she's got one of her grandchildren that's taken her home because she's got this stuff covering her eyes. And she lost the grandchild. You, you know how kids are. Kid went flitting away and she couldn't find her. She's calling their name and they didn't answer. And so she took this compact off of her eyes so she could see and when she did, she could see perfectly. Her vision was restored. The, the eye that was blind was healed, and the other eye was healed, and, and she could see perfectly. God had, had healed her, but not only did God heal her vision, but he healed everything else in her body. He, she got a complete overhaul. Everything that was wrong with her, God had healed her. And so she was so excited, she invited Charles Palm to come to her home in Galena, Kansas, and he came there and started preaching. He preached in her house and preached at the Methodist church that, where she attended church. And uh, they outgrew the house and they outgrew the, the church. And they got an old tent and started holding meetings in a tent. And everything that they had prayed for in Topeka began to happen in Galena, Kansas. Hundreds of people got saved. 
Hundreds of people were baptized right in the middle of the wintertime were baptized in the Spring River in Galena, Kansas. And hundreds of people were baptized in the Holy Spirit. It began to be a real movement in Galena, Kansas. Just outside of Galena, there's a little place, a little spot in the road called Kilville, Kilville, Kansas. And the first Pentecostal church building that was ever built is in Kilville, Kansas. It came out of that season when God was pouring out His Spirit in, in uh, Galena. So there's, a, there's the oldest Pentecostal church building in the world. After they'd gone to Galena, they went over to Joplin, Missouri. Uh, I think 400 people received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the revival in Joplin, Missouri. God's really doing some great things. He's pouring out His Spirit and using Charles Parham and his team of workers. This man, Walter Euler, had been in the revival in El Dorado Springs and God had healed him as well from sickness. And he was following Charles Parham, helping him in his meetings. He was there in Joplin. And he introduced Parham to his brother-in-law. His brother-in-law's name was H.H. H. Ayler. Now, I don't know. I may be the only thing that notices some of these oddities of history, but I think this is the oddest thing. This lady that married H.H. H. Ayler, she was an oiler. Her brother was Walter Euler. She was an oiler, and she married an Ayler. How many times does somebody get married and they just change one vowel in their name? It's a, uh, oiler became an Ayler. But, but Mr. Ayler was a, kind of a big deal down in Texas. He, he was, uh, in, lived in Orchard, Texas. And he was the railroad commissioner down there, and he was a man of, of influence and affluence. And when he met Charles Parle, he invited him to come down to Orchard, Texas and uh, preach the gospel in Orchard. And they came and they preached. And once again, they found a bunch of people hungry for God. And God began to pour out His Spirit. A lot of folks were saved, baptized in the Holy Ghost. This lady lived over in Houston. And she rode the train. She's just a young woman then. The only picture we have of her is when she's old. But a young woman, she rode the train over from Houston to Orchard. She was there on a Sunday morning. A lady named Anna Hall preached. And this lady, Etta Calhoun, received the baptism of the Holy Spirit at that revival in Orchard, Texas. Now, anybody here know who Etta Calhoun is? Anybody know who Etta Calhoun is? Pastor has heard of her. Well, you should have heard of her because Etta Calhoun started a program in the Assemblies of God called the Women's Missionary Council, the WMCs. When I was a kid growing up in the Assemblies of God, our ladies always worked and had, had sales of pies and all kinds of things, raising money to buy Crisco oil and birthday presents for missionary kids. The Women's Missionary Council was an auxiliary group that supported missionaries. They, they've done away with that today and just call it women's ministries, but it was the WMCs, and it was started by this lady. Well, after she'd received baptism of the Holy Spirit, she went back to Houston and told her pastor what God had done for her. Pastor's name is W. F. Carruthers. He was quite an interesting man. He was a judge in Houston. He, he had never gone to law school, but he self-studied and passed the Texas bar exam and then became a judge. Uh, he was also an amateur uh, astronomer, and uh, he pastored a church called the Christian Witness. Well, when he heard about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he was hungry for God. There's that word again, hungry. You can't get away from that. He was hungry for God. He wanted the Holy Spirit baptism. So he invited Charles Parham and his whole team to come to Houston. Now this is, this is a paradigm shift in the Pentecostal movement. Up till now, the Pentecostal movement had been up here in mid-America. Mid uh, it had broken out in Topeka and it spread down here to Galena and Joplin and small, relatively small cities. But now they're going to the big time. They're, they're going down to Houston, Texas. And so he loads up his whole team and he brings his whole team to Houston. There's so many side stories that I could tell, but uh, one of the men, one of the men that got the baptism, I mean, excuse me, one of the men that got saved in Galena was baptized in Spring River was a man named Howard Goss. Howard Goss was one of the original founders of the Assemblies of God. He got saved in Galena, but he had never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, while the Parham's team is going from Orchard, Texas, over to Houston, they stop at the train station in Alva, Texas. And when they stopped, or uh, Alvin, yes, when they stopped there, 
they had a prayer meeting and Howard Goss received the baptism of the Holy Ghost at the train station. I mean, you know, that'd be a, quite a prayer meeting to receive the Holy Spirit at a train station. Well, his team is in Houston now. I guess I should tell you, the reason they're dressed up in these strange costumes is people had, uh, a man had come to the Holy Land and traveled across the, the, the Atlantic on, uh, on boat and gone to the Holy Land and bought all of these costumes. These were, these were not like Christmas costumes or, or cost, Halloween costumes. These were actual clothes that people were wearing in the Holy Land. And uh, it's kind of interesting. This guy's got him an a opium pipe here. I don't know how that fit in, but... But uh, anyway, they brought these clothes and they brought them back to America and Charles Parham got these clothes from this guy and he would dress his team up in these clothes and they would advertise, you come to the meeting and you can see clothes from the Holy Land. And I know you go, whoopee. But that was before the internet or television or movies and it was a big deal to see clothes from the other side of the world. And so people come, they rented a, Hall, Casadonia Hall, and then they rented Bryan Hall and, and filled those places up with people hungry for God. God sent a mighty revival to Houston. They ended up building a tabernacle on the edge of the city called Bruner Tabernacle. Somebody donated them land. And they built a tabernacle there, and, and uh, the gospel was being preached, and great revival was breaking out in Houston. And uh, they started another Bible school in Houston called the Bible Training School down on Rust Street. And this is where things really started changing because this man, William J. Seymour, attended this Bible school. Seymour had been a, a son of slaves in Louisiana. He, he was raised in the most extreme poverty. I, I can't even begin to explain what life was like for him. Uh, he, at one point, they did an affidavit of everything his family owned. Everything his family owned and it was valued at 65 cents. They had an old mattress and an old bed and an old table and an old chair. Their, their family worth was 65 cents. That's how poor they were. And uh, he, living in a time when the White League and the KKK and other terrorist groups uh, uh, made life very difficult for African Americans. And he was born there in Louisiana. He went up into the north and got him a job working in hotels. Uh, I could tell his whole story this morning. I've got it in one of my books, but working in hotels and he found Jesus as his savior in Indianapolis, Indiana and was called to preach. And he ends up in Houston and he goes to Parham's Bible School. He had a 12-week school going on there. And, and someone heard William Seymour preach, someone from Los Angeles, a lady named Neely Terry, heard him preach and she wanted him to come to Los Angeles and preach in their church. So he got on a train, he went to Los Angeles and he's going to preach in Los Angeles. He started preaching. He preached on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they shut down the meeting, locked him out of the church. He didn't even have a place to stay. It's more of the story than I can tell. But the revival now, it's gone from mid-America down to Houston. This is what I say. It was born here in Topeka. It crawled around in this area. It stood on its feet in Houston. And then it went out to Los Angeles, and that's when it began to run. In fact, it ran over the whole world. While Seymour's gone to Houston, Charles Parham goes back to Zion, Illinois because John Alexander Dowie I was telling you about, he was getting dementia and feeble-minded and feeble -minded and losing control and Parham wanted to take over this ministry in Zion. He had a great revival in Zion. Some of the greatest leaders of the Pentecostal revival received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in Zion, Illinois. You wouldn't know most of them. I called their name Robert and Maria Brown and... and uh, uh, William Piper, uh, uh, John Sinclair. You've probably heard of John G. Lake. John G. Lake was one of, one of uh, Dowie's best lieutenants. He received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, he's, Charles Parham's in Zion, but God is moving out in California. This guy, Joseph Smale, was the pastor of the First Baptist Church in Los Angeles, and he was hungry for God. There's that word comes up over and over, hungry. You can't get anything from God if you're not hungry. You have to want it. And Joseph Smell was so hungry for God that he traveled all the way to back. To, he was from England. He traveled all the way back to the British Isles because the revival was taking place in the British Isles led by a young man in his 20s named Evan Roberts. 
And he wanted to go and see that revival. He met Evan Roberts. And Evan Roberts said to him, or he said to Evan Roberts, what could I do to have revival in Los Angeles? And Evan Roberts says, have, have service every day until God shows up. Isn't that a novel idea? <laughs> Today, churches are trying to see how little church they can have. But he said, have church every day until God shows up. So they started having service at the First Baptist Church in Los Angeles, not once, but twice every day. And God began to move. People started getting saved. People were coming from Wales to preach. And it was amazing what God was doing. But one of the deacons in the church rose up and said, Pastor, we want this revival to stop. Number one, he said, it's too noisy. There is something noisy about revival. And then number two, he said, we've got too many strange people coming to our church. We want our church to go back to the way it used to be. And they shut down a revival. Can you believe that? But they closed revival in that city. And then another guy's working and praying for revival was Frank Bartleman. Frank Bartleman many times would pray all night long. He fasted for days at a time praying for revival in Los Angeles. But most important, our story is this couple right here, Richard and Ruth Asbury, they owned a little house at 24, or 214 Bonnie Bray Street. And every night they were having prayer meetings in their house. Now these were not important, rich, powerful people. Richard was a janitor and uh, Ruth was a laundry woman. Poor, uh, lower income people, but they invited the Holy Spirit to come to their house. And after William Seymour had been kicked out of that church where he's preaching, he joined himself with these people in this house for their prayer meetings. And on April the 9th of 1906, William Seymour was standing in the home of a man named Edward Lee. Edward Lee was so hungry for God. He was working as a janitor in a bank and he'd been downstairs in the bank praying and he, he had a vision and he saw the day of Pentecost and he saw Peter and John when they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He said, I'm ready to receive now because I know what it looks like to receive the Holy Ghost. They had called a fast. They were going to fast for 10 days. How many of y'all ever fasted before? If there's any word in the English language that's misplaced, it's the word fast. Because nothing is slower than a fast. <laughs> A three-day fast is three months long if you've ever fasted for three days. They were going to fast ten days, but on the third day, Edward Lee was feeling ill. If you've ever fasted three days, that's a tough, the third day's a tough day. He was feeling ill and asked Brother Seymour to pray for him. And when William Seymour prayed for Edward Lee, he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. April the 9th, 1906. He started speaking in tongues. They came over to the house on Bonnie Bray and they were already having their prayer meeting. They asked Edward Lee to testify and he began to testify. When he did, he started speaking in other tongues and it was like a, a bomb exploded in the house. I mean, revival hit Los Angeles, California. Just like on the day of Pentecost when it said suddenly from heaven. Suddenly from heaven, revival came to Bonnie Bray. People were slain in the spirit. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. Women were running through the house, scared the kids to death. One woman never played the piano before. She lived across the street. She never played the piano. She started playing the piano under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, playing the piano and uh, singing and worshiping God. Well, they, they soon outgrew that house. Brother Seymour would stand on the street and preach to the crowds in the street, stand on the porch, I mean, preach to the crowds in the street, but they outgrew the house. They had to find a new place for church. And they moved into 312 Azusa Street, the most famous name in Pentecostal history. They rented this little building, 40 by 60 building, not nearly as big as this building, this sanctuary. But they rented this place. They had no pews, no chairs. They brought in mixed match chairs and put boards across them. They had no pulpit. They didn't even have a platform. They had two boxes for a pulpit. They had no musical instruments. The building was, was dirty. They didn't have a floor. had dirt floor in the building. It had a low ceiling. Tall people couldn't stand up straight in there. They had to bend over. It had nothing of the fineries that we understand we need for church. But boy, when they moved in there, the glory of God came down. It was amazing. I, I, I wished I had an hour just to talk about what happened there. It was amazing. 
the glory of God filled the house. They were, they were in a building 40 by 60, like I say, smaller than this considerably. By the summer of 1906, there was 1,200 people a night coming to the services. 700 packed into a building smaller than this one and another 500 on the outside looking through the doors and windows. The glory of God came down. They had an experience called the heavenly choir. Somebody over here would start singing in tongues and somebody over here would pick up the song and then somebody else would pick up the song and they said angels sang along with them. It was a glorious time. They had service three times a day. They had service at 10 o'clock in the morning, had service at noon, had service at 7 o'clock at night. But the 10 o'clock service was never over when the 12 o'clock service started. And the 12 o'clock service was still going at 7 when they started the 7 o'clock service. They were there from 10 o'clock in the morning until midnight every day of the week. They came to church seven days a week, every week of the year. Week after week after week, the glory of God came down. People were healed. People were saved. People were baptized in the Holy Spirit. People would come into Los Angeles and be drawn. When they'd come to the tr train station, they'd be drawn to this little dilapidated mission at 312 Azusa Street. It was an awesome time of God pouring out His Spirit. They published a newspaper, went all over the world. People received the baptism of the Holy Ghost just reading that newspaper. This is their credentials committee at Azusa Street. I want you to look at this picture for a minute. This, these are the leaders of the Azusa Street mission. <clears throat> now I want you to see this. I cut every one of these out of a newspaper in Los Angeles from the microfilm. But uh, look at here, mob ready for Negro. Cowboys rope and hame Negro. Mob gets another Negro. Mob will take Negroes. Negro hanged. Negro lynched, lynchers, Supreme Court dared by mob that hanged Negro. These are all stories of lynching of black men. This were all in 1906, the same year as the height of the revival. Someone has said, and I've not seen the history on it, but someone said there were more lynchings in America in 1906 than any other year in the history of America. And at the same time, at the same time that this is going on, you can see black men and white men, black women, white women working together at Azusa Street. They all prayed at the same altar. This was perhaps the greatest miracle of Azusa Street. Frank Bartleman wrote and said, the blood of Jesus washed the color line away. What a great testimony. The blood of Jesus washed the color line away. Well, that revival continued powerfully for a season and as the revival began to wane, the headquarters of the Pentecostal movement, the unofficial headquarters of the Pentecostal movement became Chicago, Illinois. And there were great churches there in Chicago, probably because of the influence of Zion. Uh, one of the leaders of the Pentecostal revival in, in uh, Chicago was a man named William H. Durham. Uh, just real quickly to introduce you to him. William H. Durham is the theological father of the Assemblies of God. He died before the Assemblies of God was founded. But William H. Durham established the theology that the Assemblies of God started on. Because up bef before William Durham, all the Pentecostal people, by and large, were out of the Methodist tradition. They were not particularly Methodist, but they were holiness, Wesley and holiness people, most of them. And they believed that sanctification was a second work of grace. They believed you sought God for salvation and then you sought God for sanctification, second work of grace. And then they believe you sought God for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But William Durham came into the Pentecostal movement from the Baptist church. And he believed that when you got saved, you also got sanctified. He believed that sanctification was a continuing work of God's grace. That when you got saved, you were sanctified. Every day you lived, you continue to be sanctified. And when you get to heaven, you'll be fully sanctified. Well, that sounds reasonable to us because that's what we believe. It's what the Assemblies of God has always taught. Boy, when he preached that at Azusa Street, it caused such an uproar. One woman stuck him with her hat pin. It was, a, it, was a, it was an unbelievable doctrine to them, but he introduced that doctrine. And uh, from Chicago, the Pentecostal movement literally spread all over the world. No, no place could call, be called the center. It spread over the world. And then 1914... The Assemblies of God was founded in Hot Springs, Arkansas. 
and uh, spread the missionary message. One more story here, a couple of things, and I'll quit. In, in White City, in Springfield, in the middle of Springfield, there was an amusement park called White City. Now, early Pentecostals didn't believe you ought to go to amusement parks. Early Pentecostals didn't believe you could do anything. <clears throat> Modern Pentecostals believe you can do everything. I think there's a little balance somewhere. But uh, they didn't believe in the amusement park and they were praying. This lady, well, I don't have her picture, but there's a lady from Azusa Street that lived in the Ozarks and she'd come back to Springfield and she was praying, Rachel Size Love. She was praying that God would send a revival to Springfield and that God would, would do away with this sinful white city. And while she was praying, she saw a sparkling fountain that came right up in the middle of, of that sin city to them, white city. That amusement, she saw a sparkling fountain and it came up and it began to grow and it grew and it grew until the waters from the sparkling fountain reached the whole world, covered the whole world. And she didn't know when she had that vision that some years later the Assemblies of God would buy that property. White City had been torn down. The Assemblies of God bought that property on Boonville Avenue and built the general headquarters of the Assemblies of God. So from that, from White City, the sparkling fountain has gone forth with the message of Christ through missionaries and literature and gospel expansion until it literally has reached the whole world. Now, to bring this down to a landing, I've got just a couple minutes left. To bring this down to a landing, what's the secret, what's the key to revival? We sit in the lives of these people. They were hungry, they walked in humility, and they lived in holiness. Those are three things that God requires of us to see revival. You say, well, do you have scripture on that? Absolutely. Second Chronicles 7, 14 says, If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. God can send revival to America today. God knows we need a revival. We're in a desperate shape today as a nation. We're divided in so many ways. We need a revival. And God can still send revival today. Yes. Hallelujah. Well, we got about two or three minutes left. I wonder if you have any questions about uh, the, the uh, lesson, anything that I've taught about Pentecost. If you've got questions about who the Antichrist is, you can ask your pastor. But <laughs> I'll try to answer any questions you have about this revival. Anybody have a question? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. He, of course, had a measure of the Spirit. He, he was used by the Spirit, but he wasn't baptized in the Holy Spirit. Anybody else? So I've so confused you that you... <laughs> Probably not like true. Something. That's not true? Probably not true. Okay. And the other was about the man that was healed of Azusa Street that had his arm severed by turning. Probably not true. Great things happened at Azusa Street. Unbelievable things. But they are recorded by numbers of people. Eyewitnesses. The newspapers. Right? One of the books that I've published, I don't have it with me, one of the books I've published has 200 pages of newspaper articles from the time Azusa Street took place. Uh, someone has written a book today filled with a lot of sensational stuff that I, that's not true. And I think that's very unfortunate because uh, enough wonderful things happened there. Now, you, 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 have to, you have to ask yourself this question. If, if probably... 50 to 75 people that were at Azusa Street shared testimonies about what happened there contemporaneous to the events. If someone had, had their arm cut off and it grew back, don't you think at least one of those people would have told that story of what they saw? And uh, it's not in any of those records. But uh, it still was a wonderful move of God. Anybody else? How many, do you know how many denominations now believe in the evidence of 
oh man, more than I could count, jillions, you know, around the world, jillions. Of, you know, the major ones are, in America, the biggest group is the Church of God in Christ and the Assemblies of God's the second largest and then the Church of God and then probably the Foursquare or the Pentecostal Holiness. But man, if you stretch it around the world, there are just jillions and jillions of denominations. Even, even people that have been historically opposed to speaking in tongues. The Southern Baptists, for the first time a couple years ago, allow their missionaries to speak in tongues. At any point up to that, if you use a Southern Baptist missionary, and you spoke in tongues, you were out. They, but they now allow their missionaries to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So it's crossing, they, it's crossing they, a lot of barriers. They estimate by next year in China there will be a, as many Pentecostal Christians in China as there are people in America. Isn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? Uh, uh, in, in Nigeria... I preached in Nigeria. The Assemblies of God has 5 million people in Nigeria. Now that's the Assemblies of God. This, the Pentecostal movement is far bigger than the Assemblies of God. But 5 million Assemblies of God people. I don't know how many million Pentecostals there are in Brazil. Assemblies of God has, I don't know, 15 million. I don't remember. But it's amazing what God's doing around the world. If, if all the Assemblies of God people were counted it would be as large as the 25th largest nation in the world. Isn't that something? Just, just assemblies of God. And people are being saved every minute, you know, yes. just every time. Every the, second they're being saved. Yeah, yeah, it's an amazing thing. Uh, we, we preach often in Ethiopia. I'll talk about that here in just a minute. But uh, in Ethiopia, 20% of the population is evangelical Christian. Uh, 30 years ago, it was 2%. Now it's like 20% of the population are evangelical Christian. And when you say you're an evangelical Christian in Ethiopia, that means you speak in tongues. I mean, 99% of the Christians in Ethiopia are spirit-filled, spirit-baptized people. All right, I think I'm out of time. Thank you all for being so uh, attentive.